with the keynote address, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Minister Forte. She was, yes, you can clap now. <laughs> I guess I don't even have to read all about you. You already get the applause. <laughs> uh, Mona was elected in 2017, the first female member of parliament in Ottawa, Vanier. She is known for getting involved in taking action, and her expertise covers the area of health care, education, job creation, and francophone affairs. Prior to being elected, the minister worked as chief, of direct, chief director of communications and market development at La Cité and managed her own strategic communications consulting firm. She has also served on several not-for-profit boards of directors, including Montfort Hospital, the Ontario Provincial Advisory Committee on Francophone Affairs, and the Shaw Centre. In addition, she has received numerous awards for her community involvement, including the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012. As a mother of three, a University of Ottawa graduate, a community leader and entrepreneur, Minister Forte knows that it is important to come together with an ambitious plan to build a stronger and better community while growing the middle, middle class. May I also just take this opportunity to thank you, Minister Forte. You have been incredibly supportive of the work that we've done together over the past two years in particular. This is the first time we've, we've had so many events together, the first time in person, so very, very pleased to welcome you here today. I wanted to start to show you, look at this. You remember last year? It was about like this. <laughs> I brought a copy if ever somebody wants to see it. Wow, so glad to see so many familiar faces this morning. C'est tellement bien de vous voir tous ici en personne. Et uh, je pense aussi peut-être en mode virtuel, uh, évidemment, ceux et celles qui sont en ligne. Um, merci d'être là. Thank you for being here, and I, I do want to start by acknowledging, uh, of course, that we are gathered here today on the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Uh, very important to recognize that. And I also want to recognize a couple of my colleagues that are here today. Yasir Nagvi, you're here now, so <laughs> Ottawa Centre. <clears throat> And we've been, we, we worked pretty hard together in the last uh, few months. Uh, we all know about the convoy, so thank you again for your leadership, yes, sir. It's uh, really good of you to be here today. Also, my uh, good friend, uh, Francesco Sorbera, he's uh, the MP for Vaughan Woodbridge, and he's with us this morning. Of course, I cannot not recognize Mathieu Fleury, who I worked very hard also in the past two years, my colleague from Rideau Vanier. And uh, I also want to take a moment to say that the NCR caucus is here to work with you. Uh, yes, or will agree with me. Uh, the National Capital Region Caucus, uh, most of them are going out today talking about the budget and we all want to continue to work with you and I want to recognize uh, everybody's hard work. And uh, of course, Suling, I want to thank you. Uh, we've been working very hard together in the last two years and your leadership for the business community is really incredible and we need to tell you to say thank you to you and your whole team for making sure that we can have these gatherings but also address the needs for the region so thank you very much and i would name all of you because we all have a uh, difference uh, that we make in our communities, uh, especially in the business uh, sector, the tourism sector. Of course, uh, it would be uh, really important to say that tourism was affected deeply in the Ottawa region, and we're working together, of course. I want to recognize Steve Ball and, and Michael. Uh, you've been doing so much great work, and we will continue to work together, for sure. Now let's talk about the budget. Um, throughout, um, I, I will go back. Throughout Ottawa's history, I want to say that the Board of uh, Trade has really helped uh, build and strengthen the city. Et à une époque où nous vivons une crise climatique, une pandémie et un terrible conflit en Europe, avec de graves répercussions humaines et économiques, les objectifs uh, d'organisation comme celle-ci n'ont jamais été aussi importants. 
les entreprises ici, à Ottawa et dans l'ensemble du pays, et des organisations comme la Chambre de commerce sont à l'origine de changements positifs. Et nous assistons à la création de nouvelles entreprises qui se consacrent à la protection de notre environnement, à la lutte contre la pandémie actuelle et à la préparation aux futures urgences sanitaires, ainsi qu'à la défense des droits de l'homme et de la justice. Today, I'm pleased to be here to provide an overview. We're all still reading it. An overview of our government's budget 2022, which, as you know, was tabled yesterday afternoon in Parliament by Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, my friend and colleague, Christia Friedland. With this budget, our government is continuing to deliver on our important commitments Canadians expect us to deliver on. And with my time here today, I will outline some of the key themes in Budget 2022 and, these, and what these mean for our businesses here in Ottawa and for Canadians. Now, since the end of the Second World War, Canada has been a steadfast defender of the rules-based international order. We have defended it because a world based on rules is Canada's national interest. But today, that order is facing an existential threat. Russia's barbaric invasion of Ukraine is not only an attack on the people of Ukraine and on Ukraine's territorial integrity, but also on democracy and the unprecedented period of prosperity and the world's democracies have worked continuously to build over the last 75 years. The events of the last months have reminded us that the international community is strongest when it's act together in defense of the values we share. In partnership with like-minded democracies around the world, the Canada will continue to stand up to the global threats that recognize no borders. National defense is fundamentally responsibility of the federal government. To Immediately reinforce Canada's national defense announcements in budget 2022 will provide a total of more than $8 billion in new funding over five years. This funding will strengthen Canada's contributions to our core alliances, bolster the cap capabilities of Canadian armed forces, continue to support culture change in a safe and healthy working environment in the Canada Armed Forces, and reinforce Canada's cyber security. And we will continue to stand with the brave people of Ukraine and work with our allies to protect and preserve democracy. Now for some it feels like a lifetime ago, while others it feels like yesterday. In 2020, the Canadian economy was hit by the pandemic. Our economy contracted by 17%, the worst recession since the 1930s. Three million Canadians lost their jobs. Many Canadians were concerned that the COVID-19 recession would hold us back for years. And we were concerned that millions of Canadians would be out of work for years and that rebuilding our country would take decades. And as a government, we knew we couldn't let that happen. In response to this unprecedented, I always have a hard time saying this word, <laughs> unprecedented emergency assistance was provided to Canadian families, workers, and businesses. And we acted swiftly and decisively to make sure Canadians knew we had their backs. Our government kept a relentless focus on jobs, on keeping Canadians employed, and on keeping their employers afloat. It was an ambitious plan, and it worked. Our economy has recovered 112% of the jobs that were lost during those awful first months, compared to just 90% in the United States. Our un unemployment rate is down to just 5.5%, close to the 5.4% low in 2019. That was Canada's best in five decades. And Canada's real GDP is more than a full percentage point above where it was before the pandemic. Because of decisive, bold action, 
Canada has come roaring back. And as the global economy changes, Canada is well positioned to prosper. Our workforce is one of the best educated in the world. But other countries are moving quickly in the global competition for investment and innovation. So we need to pick up the pace. We must do more to ensure that Canadian businesses, like the ones you represent, can continue to succeed. And Budget 2022 proposes to establish the Canada Growth Fund to attract substantial private sector investment to help achieve important national economic policy objectives. The fund will initially be capitalized at $15 billion over the next five years and will aim to leverage $3 of private capital for every dollar invested. A new innovation and investment agency, similar to those that have been successful in Finland and Israel, will work proactively with new and established Canadian industries and businesses to help them make the investments they need to innovate, grow, create jobs, and compete in a changing global economy. Now, Budget 2022 also provides the backbone of our economy, small businesses. As many of you know, these businesses currently benefit from a reduced federal tax rate of 9% on their first 500,000 of taxable income, compared to a general federal corporate tax rate of 15%. Once its level of capital employed in Canada reaches 15 million, however, a business no longer has this lower rate. Phasing out access to the lower tax rate too quickly can discourage some businesses from continuing to grow and create jobs. And that is why Budget 2022 proposes to phase out access to the small business tax rate more gradually, with access to be fully phased out when taxable capital reaches 50 million, rather than a $15 million. Now this measure would apply to taxation years that begin on or after April 7th, of this year, 2022. Et nous savons également que la pénurie de la main d'œuvre pose de réels problèmes à de nombreuses entreprises et que trop de Canadiens ont du mal à trouver un travail intéressant. Le budget 2022 présente des mesures importantes pour relever ces défis. Notre gouvernement propose d'instaurer une déduction pour la mobilité de la main d'œuvre afin de reconnaître fiscalement jusqu'à 4000 dollars par année de frais de déplacement et de réinstallation temporaire admissible pour les gens de métier et les apprentis admissibles. Nous avons également annoncé de nouveaux fonds pour soutenir le traitement et l'établissement des nouveaux résidents permanents au Canada. Et nous proposons aussi 272,6 millions de dollars pour soutenir la mise en œuvre d'une stratégie d'emploi pour les personnes handicapées. Really important uh, strategy to have more people with disabilities part of our businesses and our market. And I'm very proud of that one. You will see that we need to do that also with public service. Enfin, le budget 2022 propose 84,2 millions de dollars pour doubler le financement du programme de formation et d'innovation syndicale. Alors, ça va aider 3500 apprentis issus de groupes sous-représentés à lancer et développer les carrières avec les différents métiers spécialisés. Ensemble, ces investissements de créer de nouveaux emplois bien rémunérés pour les Canadiens, d'aider un plus grand nombre de personnes à accéder à la classe moyenne et évidemment faire du Canada un chef de file économique pour les décennies à venir. Now let's talk about housing. Everyone should have a safe and affordable place to call home. This is why Budget 2022 announced significant steps that will build more homes and make housing more affordable across the country. Not only is a housing a basic human need, it's also an economic imperative. The problem is very clear. Canada does not have enough homes. We need more of them and fast, and we know we need that in Ottawa too. This budget represents the most ambitious plan that Canada has ever had to solve the fundamental challenge. And over the next 10 years, we will double the number of new homes we build. This will become a massive national effort and it will demand a new spirit of collaboration between 
provinces and territories, municipalities, the private sector, nonprofits, organizations like the Ottawa Board of Trade, all working together with government to build the homes Canadians need. And I have a little one that I was very proud to see. I don't know if you have ever visited Veterans House in Water Ridge Village, but what's incredible is we want more Veterans House across Canada, and a big investment for that is happening. <laughs> now, with the goal of creating 100,000 net new housing units over five years, the 2022 budget proposes $4 billion over five years, beginning in 2022-2023, to launch a new housing acceleration fund. This fund will adapt to the needs and realities of cities and communities while providing support such as an annual per-door incentive or upfront funding for investments in municipal housing, planning, and delivery processes. And as home prices rise, so does the cost of a down payment, which is a major barrier for many people seeking home ownership, particularly young people. The 2022 budget proposes to introduce the tax-free first-time homebuyers savings account, which will allow potential first-time homebuyers to save up to $40,000. And as the MP of Ottawa Vanny and having lived here most of my life, I know the constant challenge associated with the need for affordable housing in our city. And this budget addresses that critical need by proposing $1.5 billion over two years starting this year to extend the rapid housing uh, initiative. This new funding will allow us to create at least 6,000 new affordable housing units across Canada, not just Ottawa, of course, with at least 25% of funding going towards women-focused housing projects. And our government is also taking a major step in making the housing market fairer for Canadians. Budget 2022 proposes to prevent foreign investors from parking their money in Canada by buying up homes. This will ensure that houses are being used as homes for Canadian families rather than as a speculative financial asset class. L'accès à un logement sûr et abordable est également essentiel pour assurer un meilleur avenir aux communautés autochtones et aux enfants autochtones. Et nous allons investir dans le logement pour les communautés autochtones. Je vais passer quelques temps parce que je vais avoir plus de temps pour des questions. In addition to investing in affordable housing for Indigenous communities, our government is committed to a renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous peoples based on recognition of rights, respect, truth, cooperation, and partnership. Budget 2022 proposes to invest an additional $11 billion over six years to continue to support Indigenous children and families and to help Indigenous communities continue to grow and shape their futures. Our government is committed to eliminating the systemic barriers that prevent First Nations children from accessing services and support they need to thrive. Jordan's principle is a vital part of this work, helping to ensure that all First Nations children can access the health, social, and educational services they need when they need them. The country was shaking following the multiple discoveries of unmarked burial sites at former residential schools over the past year, which are reminders of the shameful legacy of residential schools and colonialism. Our government will continue to be there to support communities as they respond to and heal from intergenerational trauma and the ongoing impact of residential schools. Addressing the legacy of residential schools will take time. And Canada will undertake this work in partnership with Indigenous people and communities. Now let's talk about green economy. Climate change is the biggest challenge we face, but also our biggest opportunity. Smart climate investments today are good for Canadian workers, good for the Canadian economy, and good for the planet. 
with the largest mobilization of global capital since the industrial revolution already underway, Canada has the chance to become a clean energy leader for the future. Budget 2022 to, will help Canada continue to play a leading role in global efforts to fight climate change, protect our nature, and build a clean economy that will create the well-paying middle-class jobs of today and tomorrow. And our government proposes to establish the Canada Growth Fund to attract significant private investi uh, sector investment to help achieve important national economic policy objectives, such as reducing emissions and contributing to Canada's climate goals. We will also seek to diversify our economy and boost our exports by investing in the growth of low carbon industries and new technologies in new and traditional sectors of Canada's industrial base. And we will support the restructuring of critical supply chains in areas important to Canada's future prosperity, including the natural resources sector. With the investment proposed in budget 2022, we will reduce emissions on the road, invest in clean electricity, support sustainable agriculture, further protect our oceans, take more action to eliminate plastic waste, and build greener affordable housing. But our ability to spend is not infinite. As vaccines and therapeutics have made COVID much more manageable, Time for extraordinary COVID support is at an end. We will be reviewing government spending because that is the responsible thing to do. And our government is committed to ensuring that the debt to GDP ratio continues to decline and will continue to reduce our deficits. The pandemic debt was we incurred to keep Canadians safe and solvent must and will be paid down. And this is our fiscal anchor that will ensure that our finances remain sustainable. But managing public finances in a prudent and responsible manner requires more than just words. That's why our government will commit to a review that ensures Canadians' tax dollars are being used effectively and to ensure that government programs are delivering the intended results. And to support these efforts, uh, Budget 2022 announces the launch of a comprehensive strategic policy review that I will be privileged to lead. And this review will include two streams. Stream one will assess program effectiveness in meeting the government's key priorities of strengthening economic growth, inclusiveness, and fighting climate change. And stream two, will identify opportunities to save and reallocate resources to adapt government programs and operations to a new post-pandemic reality. And of course, we will provide further details on these efforts in due course in budget 2023. We will provide an update on the review's progress. I have a year, that's a message. Alors, euh, pour terminer, permettez-moi de vous dire que nous nous trouvons dans une période qui est sans précédent. Les défis auxquels nous sommes confrontés n'ont jamais été aussi réels. Et en tant que membre du Ottawa Business Train, je vous demande de poursuivre votre important travail. Continuez à unir les chefs d'entreprise et à éliminer les obstacles. Et je vous encourage à continuer à faire ce que vous avez fait alors que nous dirigeons vers une économie plus verte et plus inclusive. And I truly believe that Budget 2022 will help you do this work. It will help support businesses like yours and create a stronger and more resilient economy for years to come. Thank you again, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you so much, Mona. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions sure. for Mona. Do we have anyone from the audience with a question for the minister? Was I that clear? Yes, <laughs> beautifully done. Yes, in the back there, Britt. Thank you. Do you mind standing up and saying who you are? I didn't know that was part of asking Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
Non, je voulais savoir concernant tous les investissements en logement, euh, ça va passer par quels organismes exactement? Est-ce que seulement par un seul ou plusieurs? Euh, moi, je suis Jenny La France, je suis en architecture, donc euh, on est très intéressé à s'investir dans le développement de ces logements-là. Mais je pense que ce qu'on vient de dire aujourd'hui, plutôt hier, c'est que les investissements en logement, c'est pas juste une affaire d'une organisation, juste le gouvernement fédéral, par exemple. C'est vraiment euh, un effort qui vient du secteur privé, qui vient des organismes à but non lucratif, euh, les provinces, les territoires, les municipalités. Alors, il va falloir travailler ensemble. L'objectif, c'est d'avoir plus de maisons, plus de logements. Alors, on va pouvoir travailler ensemble là-dessus. And for those that want to know uh, what I just said, uh, she was asking, who, who get, who, who's going to coordinate that uh, housing piece? And I said, it's everybody's business. Everybody has to get involved into housing, and there will be different means for provinces, territories, municipalities, private business, of course, uh, nonprofit organizations to be part of that solution. So thank you. Any other questions for the minister? Ian? Uh, Brittany's coming with the mic there. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Forte, for your uh, remarks this morning. You talked about fiscal anchors, and the government talks a lot about fiscal anchors. So I want to ask a question on behalf of the Auto Board of Trade and our business community about some fiscal anchors in our community and when we might see some expenditures approved. So transit north, south, east, west, and all of the transit-oriented development that I know our developers in this community and other communities are prepared to invest in. Byward Market Revitalization, La Breton Flats, the Ottawa Hospital. Um, these are big fiscal anchors that we need in our community, and we need funding. Um, not all of it is on the backs of government. Private sector needs to do their piece as well. But when can we expect some funds with respect to these huge projects that are transformational to our community? Well, great question. And uh, I can tell you, NCR caucus, we're on it, right? Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> this is something that we truly believe we need to foster for uh, the region. And I just want to remind everybody of last year, about this time. It was actually April 19th, 2021. But budget 2021 had major infrastructure dollars in there. They haven't been all spent. So that is the driver where we are going to be able to bring this forward, work with the City of Ottawa, work hopefully with the province of Ontario to make these investments in our regions. And we have to work together to get them done. So we could book a meeting? Of course. <laughs> Just okay. let me do the budget tour first. <laughs> <laughs> and last question. Burkett Foster Storm Internet. Some of that infrastructure money needs to get down to small and medium businesses like us who are doing the rural areas, and it, it tends not to get here. So I just want to make sure that the minister understands that uh, it's really important that we, we do get that. We have actually upgraded our network severely uh, and with private investment and some help from our friends at BTC. Um, to actually build uh, um, over 200 improvements in networks so people can work from home and people can learn from home. We're doing a lot of work on that, and I'd invite the minister to come and tour so she can learn a little bit more about what Excellent. we do as a small business. And I Thank will you. also bring my good friend and colleague, Goody Hutchings, who is the uh, cheerleader for uh, rural development and broadband. Awesome. And uh, we do have some investments we still need to do to make sure that everybody's connected. So let's work together on that. We will. And one of the things we really want to make sure that happens is that it's recognized that most of the work done in the rural areas is small and medium businesses. Yes. And while we're growing up, um, we're still a small and medium business and very powerful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And yes, let's work together uh, to make things happen. And Francis Devoin can uh, join me uh, on that tour for sure. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Forte, for being here today, for the work that you've done on the budget and will continue to do uh, to make sure that this uh, budget spurs economic growth in Ottawa and across the country. We and really appreciate let's it. Let's work all together to get Ottawa their fa our fair share of, uh, of that investment. Thank That's you key. so much. Thank you.
Our next speaker is a partner, Taxation Services in MNP's Ottawa office. Gavin Miranda has more than 17 years of experience helping private companies with their tax consulting and compliance needs. He's worked with clients in numerous industries, assisting them with their business models and domestic and international trade considerations. Focusing on understanding his client needs ensures that he delivers the highest quality of services and exceeds his client expectations. Now, without further ado, please help me welcome Mr. Gavin Miranda, Regional Tax Leader from MNP. Thanks. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Celine. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today and to talk to you a little bit about the details that were in the budget in terms of some specific tax measures. There wasn't much detailed legislation in there, so we have some indicators that the, what the government's going to do to implement some of these policies that Minister Fortier put out there. So I'll walk you through some of them right now. MNP, as uh, Suling mentioned, we're the fifth largest accounting firm in the country, serving small business all across the country. And really, in Ottawa, we've been here for seven years now and are proud to serve our business community as partners. Some of the budget highlights, I know Kevin will talk about this probably later, but we wanted to just show a quick snapshot of what it looked like last year and what it looks like this year. The budgetary balance, the percentage of GDP is actually going down in the 2022 projections. So that seems to be something that shows fiscal restraint. Obviously, time will tell how that comes around, but the spending that was projected is focused in certain areas, green economy and housing to be two of the major ones that we talked about, as well as the third being growth and innovation. As you see from this slide, just a quick snapshot to show that the budgetary balance is declining and that the federal debt though still increases over the period of time up to the 2027, being at $1.3 trillion. So tax measures, what came about to help small businesses here in Ottawa and across the country? As Minister Fortier highlighted, one of the things that was detrimental to small business and did prevent them from growing was the taxable capital threshold. That is how much capital a business employs. And when it reached 15 million, that phased out that small business deduction that they had available. This expansion to 50 million is very welcome because businesses, certainly businesses in our community, for example, car dealerships, which we have amounts of, that hold, or companies that hold a lot of real estate, those are capital intensive acquisitions that the companies have done and would erode their small business deduction. Increasing it, now a company that has 30 million in taxable capital will have about $250,000 of small business deduction. Before, that 30 million of capital would have given them none. So that 9% beneficial rate was not there. So this is very helpful to small business and a welcome change. Those that had 12 million in taxable capital would have now have $475,000 in small business deduction. That was of the 500,000. Now, that, that's an improvement over the 300,000 that they would have had before. And again, this will be measures that happen after budget day. The one thing that didn't change in this though, is the fact that your investment income, the aggregate investment income, if you earn investment income in the corporation that you control or your associated companies, it will still grind your small business limit. So that's something to be aware of. Something that we would encourage the government to continue to consider. This, we call this Bill C-208 in the tax community. Really, it's an intergenerational transfer. It was a private member's bill that came about that was very, very much re requested by the business community, very much requested by the tax community. It was cheaper for a business to transition to a third party than it was to transition within the family. This private member's bill that made it through allowed it for family members to pass it on to the next generation and claim their lifetime capital gains exemption. That is very very valuable. So the consultation, this, this legislation though provided some major loopholes because it was a private member's bill. It wasn't drafted by the Department of Finance. The government has said that they're committed to intergenerational transfers, which we, which we welcome because Canada is, is an entrepreneurial society and we have so many small businesses, especially here in Ottawa, and we want them to transfer like our partners here today, Oakwood Homes, that's a fourth generation business. So they're going to consult and legislation is going to be introduced in the fall as to how this is going to continue. Am I on? Yep, so the, the currently, one of the things that is advantageous if you had a public company or a foreign owned company, if you had business income in that company in, 
in Canada. In Ontario, that's taxed at a 26.5% rate. If you had a capital gain in that company, that's taxed at a 13% rate. Small business or CCPCs, as we know, are unfortunately taxed at a 50% rate because they pay an additional incremental tax. So there, were, there was plans that were put in place to allow CCPCs or small business to take advantage of that rate and level the playing field on that investment income. The government did take that away, and so there's no longer this deferral that's available to small businesses. So it's a little bit of a disparity between how foreign-owned corp corporations can earn investment income versus what CCPCs can earn investment income. So they, they'll call them substantive CCPCs, and this measure is going to be applicable to taxation years that start after budget day. Employee ownership trusts. This is something that was announced last year. It hasn't really taken up much traction, but this is also very welcome for the business community. As we know, there's a lot of succession that's been happening in the marketplace. There's been a lot of exits, but there hasn't been as many management buyouts. This employee ownership trust will help to facilitate transition to key employees or to incentivize employees to stay with the business by giving them the opportunity to have a piece of equity while still allowing the owner to maintain control of that business. So we see this as being an important tool to drive succession in terms of management planning and to also allow those people to get the benefits of stock option type deductions in the future. Waiting to see again how the legislation comes out, but we're hoping that all of those things will be addressed when the government does put that out. One of the things that was announced, which is significant, and I mention it because it was so, so large, it's not particular to small business here in Ottawa or the business community here, but this Canada recovery dividend is a one-time 15% tax on bank and life insurance groups. That is as of their October 2021 year end on their taxable income. They are going to have five years to pay that tax, so be aware that that's a big burden. And I just query, in the end, how much of that additional burden will get passed on to the ultimate consumer. So, And there will be an ongoing additional 1.5% tax on the taxable income of life insurance and banks. There were green economy measures, as we anticipated. Oh. Sorry. Apologies. Yep. So there's an investment tax credit for carbon capture, a utilization and storage. So that's going to be a 30% type credit. That's important as they continue to invest in the green economy and make these strides. Expanded depreciation for investing in certain types of equipment and there'll be a rate reduction for manufacturers that also take into doing air source heat pumps for space heating and again fostering their green economy initiative. The government did say that they're going to look at investment in small business. They're going to see whether the tax system is providing adequate support to investments in growing small business. One of the things that's been very difficult for entrepreneurs is when they exit a business or angel investors, if they, if they invest to help the community and the business grow and exit that business, they realize a gain on the disposition. It's hard for them to take that capital and reinvest it somewhere else without paying tax which is fair, but at the same time, if we want to foster more innovation and more growth, then having an ability to roll over or defer the gain by making qualified investments going forward is a means to spur future growth in our business and in our economy. So that's something that's going to be looked at to help, to help grow that in the future. The other, asp the other couple of items that are coming around, critical mineral exploration tax credit. So a 30% tax credit for exploring specified minerals for production of batteries and permanent magnets, so lithium and those types of minerals we anticipate when we see the legislation. So this would be flow through, which means that investors can invest in these type of companies and the deductions for going out and exploring are passed along to the individual such that they can take the write off personally. So this would be beneficial because it fosters more exploration in this sector. What they're taking away is if you do exploration for oil and gas. So along with their green initiatives, saying that we're not gonna rely so much on fossil fuels, we're not gonna give you this incentive and therefore take away from a policy perspective the benefits of ex investing in oil and gas. The other thing is they're going to, as for the housing agenda, they're going to look at 
corporations, large corporations that have invested in real estate as an asset class. The goal being why, is the, the, why have these residential units, if you will, been taken out of the supply? And is that adequate? They're not proposing yet what they're going to do, they're going to study it to see. So if, if you have companies, significant companies that hold a real estate portfolio, the question will come is, will there be a different type of taxation on that to disincentivize you from holding it as an asset class? That would be a fundamental shift in. Now to the personal tax measures that we saw in the budget. Going along the same themes that the government put in place, there's, there's a multi-general home renovation tax credit. This is something MNP put forth in, in our submissions to the government as well. So we're good to see that it was, they, they acknowledged it. If you, qual if you renovate your existing dwelling for a family member to have access to live with you, then you will be able to get a tax credit, which is 15% lesser of eligible expenses or $50,000. Or $50, so that's something that I know people have done during the pandemic when people were living by themselves, people were in long-term care homes. So as our population continues to age, this is going to say, well, there will be a place for the, the people to stay. And this will apply for 2023 and subsequent years. The home accessibility tax credit, so for those people that, are that have disabled family members that are going to do renovations at their home, there will be a tax credit. Again, 15% of 10,000, so 1,500 bucks, it's now doubled to $3,000 for 2022 and later years, so this year and forward. The first time home buyer's tax credit, which was $750, will now be $1,500. And that's another measure that they're doing to incentivize um, and help the first time buyers come through. This one is probably the biggest change that we saw in the budget from a tax perspective, the tax-free first time home buyer savings account. So its new account will be in 2023, not this year. And contributions to this account are gonna be tax deductible. So before we had the RRSP system where you could put your contributions in your RSP, take it out and then repay that amount over 15 years. So now we're gonna get a tax deduction when you contribute into this account when you pull the money out of that account, it's not gonna be taxable, but you have to pull it out to buy a house. The maximum that you can do is $40,000 per individual, and the maximum contribution per year is $8,000. That $8,000 per year cannot be carried forward. It's not like unused contribution room in your RSP that can be carried forward. It's a use it or lose it in the year. You can open your account when you're 18 years old. The latest you can open your account is 40. There's a 15 year window that you can have that account open. So there's 15 years of tax free growth that you can have it. And one of the neat things that they've proposed is that with this FHSA, you can transfer funds from your FHSA into your RSP without impacting your contribution room. So if you then go and, and get, get, get a house through inheritance and you're not gonna buy your house, you can move that funds over into your RSP without impacting any contribution room. Or to fund your FHSA, you can move the funds from your RSP into your FHSA on an annual basis of $8,000. We still have to see the legislation. We, that, that's to come out to talk about the, the specifics of it, but this will be something to consider going forward. This will, it looks like, also create more demand. So the question is, how are we gonna have the supply to keep up with the demand that this is going to create, especially in Ottawa from what we've seen in the last two years in this pandemic? The new flipping tax. So there is gonna be a rule to say that if you sell your home within 12 months, that that is gonna be fully taxable. So there's been a lot of talk about taking away the principal residence exemption. They didn't do that. They said, if you flip your home within 12 months, you will be taxed on that. And obviously there has been re reporting on principal residence sales in your annual compliance for a number of years now, but there are a list of exceptions. So proposed death, if you have a household addition, so obviously you know your family grew, you got married, separation, your personal safety, disability, employment change if you're moving, to, you know you have to have a move or you lose your job, insolvency, which would go with that, and then an involuntary disposition if your house gets appropriated or burned down or so on and so forth. The question is, how, did, how are they gonna bring these in and how is the government really gonna police that or the CRA gonna administer this? How do you say to someone, prove to me that by the time they go to audit this three years down the road that you were insolvent at that point in time without actually declaring bankruptcy? So there are lots of questions that we'll need to, uh, we'll need to be dealt with in this. The labor mobility deduction for tradespeople. There's a labor shortage 
we, we see across the country, we're at high levels of employment. So when tradespeople are taking jobs elsewhere or need to move, work elsewhere, they'll get up to $4,000 of travel expenses that they can deduct. And that applies for 2022 and later years. The minimum tax, it's, it was introduced in 1986 and hasn't been changed since then. The government is looking as to how they will revamp the minimum tax. And arguably, the minimum tax is going to go up in that they're going to expect income earners to pay a certain level of tax regardless. So that's something that is to be released again in the fall after consultation in the summer and then comment period thereafter. There were some brief indirect tax measures that came about. There's some health, additional health care rebates that are coming along uh, for people, for places that are doing clinical work and so on. One of the ones that are, that's interesting in, in, in our environment where we see a lot of housing is where people enter into a contract with a builder, but prior to that being built, they assign that contract to someone else and, or sell that contract potentially. When they do that, it wasn't being subject to HST, so now it's gonna be subject to HST as well. And they're now also introducing a tax on vaping products. And the other thing that they did lower was they took away the tax on low alcoholic beer less than 0.5%. So nothing that anyone in this room would drink, so it didn't really impact you. <laughs> uh, tax administration. One of the things that is in the act is called a, a general anti-avoidance rule. And it's one of those rules that the government says, if, you're, if you are able to plan around specific rules in the act, we can always use this rule to say, we don't like it, we're gonna challenge it. So they're gonna give this more teeth which in the tax community is a little bit, and as taxpayers, it's a little bit, provides so much uncertainty because we have specific rules in the act that we look and abide by. And now they're saying if we don't, if you do something that allows you to plan appropriately around those rules, we can always bring in this and then attack it. So it's where are you giving taxpayers certainty on how they can plan their affairs and how can they appropriately structure their affairs. Um, they're going to provide another $1.2 billion in funding to the CRA over the next five years. So as we know, the budget deficit is there. They will need to recoup it. So we've seen in our client base, audits have increased, it, audit, desk audits and full-blown audits have increased. So be aware that this will take place in the future. And disbursement quotas will increase on, on registered charities as well. So on, on assets in the sex of a million dollars. So some final thoughts. The budget obviously didn't put out as much spending as everyone anticipated. It was still focused a lot on spending. GDP grew, so as a percentage of, of budget, it's obviously stayed the same, but in absolute dollars, it has gone up. I think the critical question certainly for us in Ottawa as we see it is how are they gonna deal with the supply side of the housing and across the country where yes, they can, they can put in measures to help people buy the home, but I know our home builder clients don't have access to any more materials. They don't have access to any supply chain faster. So how is that going to actually create uh, demand? I know at our table we were speaking about, you know, we have now in, in the downtown, how do we revitalize? We do have all of these office buildings that are so outdated and so dilapidated, you know, to be blunt. How do we repurpose those to condominium units or something like that so we get affordable housing back into the city and help our and serve the dual purpose of meeting housing needs and helping our downtown th thrive again after the most recent uh, disruptive events so that's it uh, so stay tuned if you have any other uh, reach out to an mp advisor and we're, we'll be happy to connect with you to talk about uh, what's going on and what we see and what's uh, what's going to happen in the future all right thank you very much appreciate your time Thank you, Gavin, for that excellent overview. And I think last year you were open to sharing your slides, so can we share those with our folks? Great, that's fantastic. Um, now we're gonna move on to our uh, panel discussion. So I invite Carl, Kyle Larkin, the VP at Impact Public Affairs, uh, to the stage and to join them, Kevin Page and Goldie Hyder. Good morning, good morning, everyone. So we've had some great remarks from the minister a great breakdown by Gavin. Uh, I could just say go and you two could just talk for 30 minutes. Um, but why don't we just start by a, a top line reaction. What do you like? What do you dislike? Goldie, let's start with you. Well, I do like that last year's was 700 pages and this one's 300 pages. So that, that in itself is a very good sign because it does mean, um, at least um, from, a, from a content perspective, a little more focus. Uh, and hopefully a little less spending. And in many ways, I think both of those things um, were achieved. 
our overall reaction was it's a, it's a budget that is heading in the right direction. Uh, you didn't hear build back better or I got your back anymore. Uh, all of that rhetoric that happened over the course of the last two years, which was a way to say the pandemic's over, we're just going to start reimagining Canada. We're like, well, we wouldn't have reimagined Canada if there wasn't a pandemic. Why, why do we need to do that? So I think all of that stuff is gone now because the reality check hit. Governing is hard. Uh, you actually have to make some serious choices. And if you're not careful, it will lead to capital flight and talent flight. And I think the message that the minister received yesterday and, and communicated, actually, uh, that she received in the process of the budget, but communicated yesterday was, I get it. Uh, I get it. I do believe in productivity. I do believe in competitiveness. I do believe in growth. They promised us that's what they would do. Now, look, in a document of 300 pages, you're bound to find things you like and things you don't like. So overall, I would say that we see um, elements of a plan there. They'll call it their plan. I think all the pieces are starting to come together. Uh, we'd, like to think, we'd like to believe that uh, there's a recognition that just as the pandemic afforded business and government an opportunity to work together, uh, to do so on the economic growth strategy is probably even more imperative and even more important that we do that. The thing I like about the, the, the emphasis that they're putting on the growth fund and, the, and the, uh, the new agency and so forth is, interestingly, they're actually playing to our strengths. The focus on the expenditures on these things is to our strengths. And by that I mean in the natural resources arena and in the human resources arena. So whether it's oil and gas or mining or agriculture or technology, we're not trying to, to pretend we're going to be something other than who we actually are. And so instead of going about inventing things, we're actually going to just innovate. And we're going to innovate in those areas to help. And yes, this shouldn't come as a surprise. The Prime Minister's you know, so-called legacy project is the climate change agenda. The truth is, you know, Canada's emissions are a very, very small percentage of global emissions. Okay? Our real contribution will be the innovation and the ability to build and, and really help other countries bring down their emissions. So I like the approach. I'm cautious because of the history of the infrastructure bank. Uh, Well-intentioned, I'm not sure we even needed it to tell you the truth, but it didn't work. It's in comatose for most, for most people. Let's make sure this agency, which is $15 billion worth of uh, the fund, excuse me, to help bring down emissions, build a low-carbon economy, and at the same time, uh, you know, create a supply chain inter infrastructure for critical minerals and uh, electrical vehicles and batteries and stuff. That has merit. So those are the things that we like, and we can maybe come to things we don't like, but maybe get Kevin to say what he likes first, too. Perfect. Kevin, top-line reaction? Uh, well, I really like the fact that there's no tax on non-alcoholic beers. Your mic, your mic, Kevin. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I think it's on. I think it's on. Test? Yeah, so I really like the fact that there's no tax on non-alcoholic beers. Because uh, those beers are getting much better. Uh, and I do drink them. I also, I think, maybe this is echoing what Goldie said. I think it's, um, it's a budget that was very measured. It was modest, and I think in, this, in these times, responsible. And I think, when, what I mean by that, measured in the sense that, like, if you look at the numbers, um, they took basically a projection that says the economy is going to be a little bit stronger than what it was uh, in the fall. And it generates like about $85 billion over the next six years. And they said, we're not going to spend all of that. We're going to spend on a net basis maybe a little over $30 billion. And the rest of it we're going to put to deficit reduction. And to me, that's measured. And then when you look at the spending, um, you, know, the, you know, that net spending of $30 billion, Actually, it's about $60 billion in terms of gross spending. And it's pretty much allocated across some key priorities. Goldie talked about the growth, and the minister talked about housing, you know, the green stuff. So it's kind of balanced in that sense. But, you know, they didn't, you know, that $60 billion gross spending, they basically went out and said, well, we're going to offset that. You know, we need to be kind of responsible. So they you know, said, so we're going to raise some taxes a little bit, not going to hurt the economy too much. We're going to kind of, you know, we know we're not going to get all that infrastructure money out the door. And I think that's a really unfortunate point. I think there are some anchors with respect to infrastructure. We should talk about that. And, and you know, we're going to find efficiencies in government. Like, you know, government got kind of bloated, you know, in 2020, 21. We should be finding efficiencies. So to me, that is measured. It is modest. Like, you know, $30 billion in net spending over six years. When we spend every year, we spend $425 billion. The economy is $2.7 trillion in 2022. That is not a lot of money. We had one measure in Budget 2021. Goldie talked about Budget 2021. One measure that the, the Early Learning Child Care Program, that was $30 billion. One signature measure was $30 billion. They have you know, a number of measures, and it's spread over six years. 
I say it's responsible. And again, it's responsible. It has to be calibrated for the times. I think there's a risk that the, we don't know what the economy is going to look like come the fall or next year. There is some pretty significant clouds with respect to the, you know, this sort of second global supply shock, Russia, Ukraine. Uh, war, which is tr uh, tr you know tragic, we could find ourselves in a very different economic s uh, situation. So it's smart to be a bit modest and a bit measured in this environment. But I would say criticize them a little bit. Those forecasts are pretty optimistic. When you look at those numbers, growth of four percent real GDP in 2022. I mean, Goldie's you know it's it's a strong number. It's probably twice the potential growth rate. Interest rates almost don't change in this forecast. Well, everybody knows that Mr. Macklin's going to be raising interest rates. And inflation, they see, is going to go up to 4% CPI and then come back down to 2% in 2023. We could hit 8% in a couple of months because of Russia and Ukraine. So they didn't put any, you know, there was no contingency reserve. There was no prudence in it. Maybe, you know, but they said, you know what, we're not going to do the, the contingency reserve stuff, but we're going to be modest. We're going to be measured. We don't know where the economy is going to go. Stay tuned. There's going to be probably something more in the fall. So you spoke but the tax on beer. That's terrific. Yeah, it's a good one. There, there's there's some good IPAs that have no no alcohol, which is very surprising. But um, go back to you, Kevin. Let's talk about a little bit about the fiscal framework, the fiscal strategy in this budget. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So it's like Goldie said, it's it's so different than budget uh, 2021, which I think we could be very critical of. I think the it's basically like they say the government's fiscal anchors are declining debt to GDP ratio. Uh, so like this year we're probably going to be the way they measure debt about 46 percent uh, of federal debt relative to GDP, uh, going down about 42 percent. Those numbers, if we can get those numbers, you know, if you're a bond rating agency, if you're the financial markets, if you're a finance minister in Europe, saying that's a, that's pretty good. If you can deliver that, that is good. Uh, the deficits, when people talk about these big deficits, they're falling really quickly. The government is vacating that economic space. They were playing big time last year. The deficit was now projected to be $114 billion in 21-22. That is about, um, you know, about five percentage points of GDP. It's going to fall this year, estimated to about $50 billion. It's being cut in half. That's about 2% of GDP. Then it falls after that. So you can see that from a deficit projection, that looks responsible. Can I answer the same question? Because I think part of the way this budget was set up was really, um, you know, there's an old saying, I think it was uh, Prime Minister Chamberlain who had said, you know, what do you fear the most? Events, my dear boy, events. And when you think about it, there have been three events that I think helped shape this budget. The first was an election. Uh, there was an election, they won, uh, they have a platform, it had $78 billion worth of spending promises on all kinds of things. Uh, and they could have said, hey, we have a mandate. It's a democracy, that's what the people chose, and we're, that's what we want to do. But then another event happened, the war. And the war changed the frame to say, oh my God, I haven't seen this kind of geopolitical uncertainty, and there's a lot of pressure on us from our NATO allies, from the, obviously the United States and others, to up our game uh, in the defense arena. I actually wrote a second amendment, if you will, an amended letter to my own letter to the minister, because this event changed what I had said in the budget letter, which was all, all focused on the situation at the time, said we, as, we actually want to see investment in the defense uh, commitments because it's about your principles, I mean, your values. If you want to be taken seriously in the world, you got to be a you know, country of your word. And we're a long ways from getting to where we need to get to, but at least directionally now, we're able to say it. In fact, they took our exact recommendation in our letter, which was put the spending in defense and find it in program review. And they, the numbers are identical, six billion in, six billion in program review. Now they need to find that six billion and uh, minister Fortier is, I guess, in charge of that, but hopefully they will find it. I'm sure people, uh, fiscal folks like Francesco and Yasser and other will keep them to account uh, to, to do that, so it's not, um, not um, new money. Then there was this third event, and that was the political event. Uh, I'm not in the business of commenting on that. I'll just say that, that whatever it's called, uh, the agreement with the NDP, obviously is a new frame from which to look at it. Strangely, it might have actually led to some of the things that Minister Freeland was able to do yesterday, knowing that you can give a little bit over here, because really, at the end of the day, the dental program is a billion dollars a year. It's to really help people who need, need, need the coverage. Um, you know, it's low income. No one's going to take on a $5 billion program in a $2 trillion economy, right? So they can give a little. But boy, they were able to do a lot of other things over here in some of those economic buckets that they might not have been able to do if they thought they couldn't have had the guaranteed support uh, over there. So it's an interesting way to look at it. And the question I had asked myself is, which one of those prisms did the minister look at the budget through? Because there's a risk that you, 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 you either put the emphasis on, 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 all, on one thing 
or you mishmash it all. Now, I do think there's a bit of mishmash here, but, I, but I, as I said, I think the benefit is, is a business community is pleasantly surprised at the restricted spending to some extent, the emphasis on growth, uh, the emphasis on partnership with business in some of these areas like uh, the climate change agenda and the green transition, but oh, innovation more broadly. We need to grow our economy. That is the best way to avoid more deficit, more debt, and to manage uh, risk and uncertainty as we go forward. Perfect. So, but, so you both mentioned it. We're going through a time of economic uncertainty right now. What do you think this budget does for business confidence, competitiveness? How do we get investments into Canada? Goldie, do you want to start? Yeah, look, I, here I'm going to be a, a little bit more critical. I think there's a couple of places where they could have uh, chosen a different, uh, different path. First one's on the fiscal anchor. The fiscal anchor that they've continued to stick with is the traditional debt to GDP ratio. Well, the traditional debt to GDP ratio is grossly you know, affected by nominal GDP, which has benefited from inflation and high commodities prices. And so what used to be a 30% debt to GDP ratio went up to 50 or something, and now they're saying, well, we're going to get it down to 42. Well, it used to be 30. We need to get down to where we were if that's the way you're going to measure it. It's going to take a long time to get there because, as Kevin rightly points out, much of these budgets, and this is not a, 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 a new thing, every budget has assumptions, every budget has forecasts, everybody, every budget tries to do their best to pre present the best scenario between now and the next five years. We don't know. Because of the uncertainty, because of the volatility, because of the risks, and I mean, you know, I'm more worried about China than I'm about anything else today, even more than the war to some extent. The war, I hope, is going to come to some kind of a resolution where there's a mediated settlement sooner rather than later. But the China management of COVID is deeply concerning from an economic perspective of global impact when you have a port in Shanghai shut down. Uh, that's going to have more supply chain impacts, more inflationary pressures that are out there. So we would have preferred to see a fiscal anchor that David Dodge has been advocating, and perhaps you too, Kevin, I don't know, so I don't want to brand it wrongly, but uh, David is where I first heard it, which is um, what are the, the, the cost uh, of borrowing, so your, the amount being spent on interest, as a percentage of the revenues, right? Because the revenues are going to flow. And I'm also worried of an actual economic slowdown, which I don't think is being anticipated here. Uh, I'm not an economist, so I'm well out of my, my realm here, but everything I see and read says the economy is going to slow down because Tiff Macklin's going to make it slow down. And after yesterday, he's probably more motivated to make it slow down because the, really the, the management of inflation has now fallen squarely in his lap. And so you're going to get your half a point, and you'll probably maybe get another half a point, but certainly another quarter point coming after that. And so we've got to watch that. And if your revenues are going down and your, your borrowing costs are going up, then that's how you stay honest with how you're going to spend that money, whether you need to spend that money or not. This debt to GDP thing gives them a bit of a free pass and a bit of a free hook. So blue, you know, the people in the party who are worried about spending, watch that <laughs> uh, very, very carefully. And then the second thing, and I, look, I'm, I've been in politics, uh, around, in and around politics my whole life, so I get it. it you, know, you can never take the politics out of politics. But this targeted tax on banks, you know, it's, a, it's purely populist. It's purely driven by polling and feel good. And as Canadians, we've got to stop wanting to rip down our successful. Thank God for our financial sector community that was there during the 2008 crisis that withstood all of that global pressure. Thank God they were partners in the, in the, in the uh, pandemic for the last two years, starting with the mortgage relief for Canadians. That wasn't a law. That wasn't mandated. They did it because of the right thing to do. The ability to pivot people to work from home, the ability to support and execute government programs from SUS to CERB to LEAF to every other acronym that you can think of, those were our banks. And so their reward was a bank tax. Makes you feel good if you're in politics. Not so good if not only are you a banker, but more importantly, if you target a specific sector. You know what every other sector says? Am I next? Am I next? And if you're trying to attract capital and you're trying to attract talent into the country to grow your economy, you don't want to send a signal like that that says, not only am I not managing my fiscal anchor the way I should be, because again, you look at that and you say, that means I'm going to pay more taxes when I come here, but I might be the victim of a direct hit without even knowing it. So I, I get the politics. I don't think it was good public policy. Kevin, thoughts there? Business confidence? What does this budget do? <clears throat> Um, I, I think this, well, this budget is probably has more of a medium-term focus. It's, it's not a lot there that's going to like solve growth and affordability in 2022. <clears throat> I think the best thing I think that, you know, this government could do through this budget, and I think it's, for the most part, it's really tried, is to kind of normalize the environment. So mm -hmm. with, you know, like Goalie talked about Bank of Canada, we know interest rates have to be normalized. Like when you see, you know, these policy rates sitting at 50 basis points, 
and you know that, you know, and you, you, see, you see the level of other interest rates and you see what's happening to inflation, like who really wants to save money in this environment? So we have to get to a better environment, that relationship between, I think, inflation and interest rates over the next few years. And, you know, Mr. Macklin is going to work hard to do that. And I think fiscally, we had to make sure that we didn't have a budget that was going to increase inflation, which would destabilize the economy, because I think what Goldie was alluding to, uh, we need to think more longer term. If we found ourselves with a very inflationary budget that really boosted up the inflation rate, then we're going to put a lot more pressure on the bank, you know, the governor of the Bank of Canada to raise interest rates even faster, and that would mean a recession in 2023, and nobody really wants that. But I think there's there's something that was a little bit missing that was raised by this really good question on infrastructure. In 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 budget 2021, there was just a little nod to the need to have a national infrastructure needs assessment for Canada, and this was really came from Minister McKenna when she was Minister of the Infrastructure. The United Kingdom has just gone through that process. Australia is doing it, New Zealand is doing it. Everybody's looking at their infrastructure stock and saying, this is a net zero. We're not, we're kidding ourselves that this is net zero. We gotta really take a hard look at this. So we gotta assess those sorts of needs, you know, from sustainability, from growth, from inclusion, from resiliency. What does it really look like now how far, what's the gap look like? What does the, this infrastructure need to look like in 2050? We need to analyze that. That creates the pipeline of projects, but people say, and which is really good for the private sector, because they say, well, I want to put my money here or there, whether it's green or whether it's growth or whether it's an inclusion project, social housing, whatever, they can see the pipeline. This is a black box in Canada. And I, I was a bit disappointed that this government is reprofiling infrastructure spending over the next five years. They say they can't get it out the door. I could kind of understand it. It's a bit of a hot market right now in terms of construction, but we got to change the stock of infrastructure to get to a better, better place by 2050. We'll never get there. We're just fooling ourselves. Perfect. So Gavin spoke about it a bit, talking about labor, you know, hotels, restaurants, construction, almost every industry in Canada is having a labor shortage right now. What do you think this budget does to help that issue? Well, actually, um, not everything is in a budget. Uh, this, uh, an area where I think this government deserves a tremendous amount of credit uh, is on immigration policy. Uh, we have been uh, witnessing a constant increase of levels admitted year over year. And all of you know that immigration is probably the sole driver of our GDP growth. Right? We had no immigration in 2020. We had no GDP growth, shockingly. We had a little bit of immigration in 2021. We had a little bit of GDP growth. 2022, the numbers are going up. We're probably going to get a lot more GDP growth. So the, 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 the ability to attract talent remains, in, in a short period of time, it'll be the only uh, reason that the labor force is growing is immigration. Uh, we have, the, you know, 50 years ago, we had seven workers to one retiree. We have three workers today to one retiree. That's why your taxes are what they are. Imagine we're on our road to two. Two workers, one retiree. That's not a good ratio, right, Kevin? I don't have to be an economist to say that. It's, it's, it's not a good ratio. So the only way we're going to help is to bring in the labor. And I think the fact that we've been able to take, Mr. Moroni had brought the numbers up to a quarter of a million or so a year, and they'd largely stayed there since that time. Now, um, we're, we're over 400,000. Uh, we're going to get closer to 450. Uh, it, we should be at about 1.2% of our population. We actually just crossed over 1% now. So we're heading in the right direction. I will just say, though, it's critical that we maintain support for immigration. Of all of the things that are critical to our economy, I, I say there are three legs to the stool of the Canadian economy. Foreign investment, trade, and immigration. Of them, the most emotional is immigration. That's what led to a Donald Trump presidency when all is ripped apart as to what the core issue was. It's probably an underpinning of a lot of what the convoy was all about. This sense of, of uh, you know, I mean, got to blame somebody. Let's blame the immigrants. Maintaining support for immigration is something we in the business community have worked very hard at. And I'm happy to say the three major political parties have pretty much bought that line. No one has come out there, and, and the one party that's been anti-immigrant has won zero seats in the last two elections. But they've doubled their vote in the last little while here. So we've got to watch that, right? Got to, got, to, got to watch that. The skills agenda is connected to the labor force investments as well. And so there, I think there's an opportunity for businesses to lead. Uh, there's a lot of examples of businesses doing micro-credentialing programs, uh, mini universities inside. Because what, you know, what business is realizing is, um, I need that labor. If it's doing this and it's not going to be able to do that in a little while, I will train it to do this thing that I'm going to be needing. I'm not letting them go. Because really, when it comes to the labor issues, businesses have three choices, right? Automate, outsource, and relocate. We certainly don't want them to relocate out of Canada. 
and obviously automation is going to continue to happen. It's, it's happening anyways. But we want to make sure that we have the capacity to fill those jobs in the country. And that means addressing some of the things that I think the minister spoke about in French as well, particularly with making sure that people who are here are fully utilized. I have a child with a special needs. To have that child get a job as she did in COVID and be renewed four or five times means somebody really needed her to do that job. They're not renewing her out of the goodness of their heart. She's actually adding value to that company. We have 750,000 disabled people in this country who could be working and should be working and contributing to the economy. Indigenous community, 50% of them are below the age of 25. They want to work, they want the skills, they want to grow, they want equity, they want to play. Give them a chance uh, to do that. And again, businesses can be leaders in doing that. For the longest time, women were not fully utilized in our workforce, and I'm saying this with respect as a father of three daughters, but childcare largely was a woman, uh, it prevented women from being able to, pr to engage in the workforce now, and we supported this all the way through, including with the labor movement, said we need these programs so we can get the labor force uh, back that's there. The foreign skills cr uh, accredi uh, accreditation issue, right, largely a provincial issue with pro professional bodies, but it's, we're duping immigrants to say come to Canada and practice what it is we've assessed you to be able to do in Canada, because remember, they go through a very rigorous screening process, and then they get here and we say, well, you can't be an engineer, you can't be a doctor, you can't be a nurse, you can't be, well, why do we lie to them? Like, let's figure out a way to make sure that if you're coming here, we can utilize your full capacity and your, and your full capability of your education. So we have work to do in some of those areas, but I think the government on the immigration question and the partnership on skills uh, is on the right track. Totally agree. Any last thoughts on that before I open it up to the Q&A? Uh, I like the fact that there's no tax on I like the fact that there's no tax on beer. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Good so way to an alcoholic beer for the record. Not yeah. Alcoholic uh, yeah, beer, yeah, just to qualify. That's the next step. <laughs> next step. Uh, any questions from the audience that uh, that I can field? Bob's got one. Bob. Don't know if there's a Roman mic. Yeah, we'll repeat um, it. Pre-COVID, energy sector, eight percent Canada's GDP. COVID, less than four percent. Today, back up eight and a half percent. The reason we're back in the position we are is a large contributor from the energy sector, but it's not talked about. And I guess the challenge is, what does the transition really look like given the developments uh, rest of the world, including in Europe? And uh, are we not gonna get a knock on the door one of these days soon to say, hey, uh, we hear you with the transition, but w we need to develop the sector and the world needs our product. So I, I'm hearing a lot of this. Uh, I've spent 10 of the last 20 days in Washington. I'm back there on Monday uh, meeting with, well, first question they asked was, what can you do for Ukraine? And sadly, the answer for the reason that Kevin gave on infrastructure was nothing. You can't do anything uh, when it comes to energy, right? And as my father likes to say, the problem in Canada is there are no problems, so we make them all up. I mean, you have all these natural resources and you have no infrastructure to get a product to market. We can't even get it. In fact, when I was there to complain about the KXL decision, first thing they pointed out to me was, how's Energy East doing? <laughs> right? So this is on us, people. This is on us. Um, we've, been, we've had this agenda, I use this word, my comms team freaks out. I don't know how else to describe it, but the movements have hijacked any rational conversation uh, about the energy sector and about the need for energy and the demand for energy, which looks like this on the OECD graph. Not mine, not the energy sectors, OECD. The demand for energy is like this. There's such a demand that the President of the United States had to phone Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, and Iran, and two of them haven't returned his call. Right? He had to reach into 50 million barrels of reserve, which he now has announced is a million a day for 180 days, only to give the energy sector time to be ready to replace that one million on their own. You think there is demand for oil? <laughs> <laughs> right? And this is a country that has fracking. It can't use that oil because it's light oil and they don't have the refineries to do it. So they're exporting all of that. You know what Europe needs from us right now? LNG. If we could get them LNG and they could store it, they would be able to get off Russian gas. Do you know what happened in Europe when Russia invaded Crimea? The purchase of Russian gas went up 25%. So Putin thinks this is a marketing event. My sales went up after I invaded another place. Why wouldn't I try another one? So we're sending the wrong signals for this kind of behavior if only we could get them our own. And this is a place in Europe where they're trying to shut down nuclear and open up coal plants. Right? Japan shut down nuclear to open up coal plants. If only Canada could get the resources that we have to those markets. So the world's looking at us. I think we need to have an adult conversation about this in this country. 
I think Minister Gibbo and Minister Wilkinson have come to the reality check moment of saying, wow, we made all of these commitments on where we're going to be in 2030. That's not that far away anymore. Right? That's not that far away. We're supposed to hit 40% reductions. We've done one in, since 2007. Um, how are we going to get there? The demand is still there. The industry is committed to the innovation. Uh, we're the ones who asked for the carbon capture uh, tax credit. Remember, capturing carbon is all cost to a business. There's, no, there's nobody I'm reselling carbon to. <laughs> we're just simply doing a societal good, taking carbon out of the sky, burying it, and, you, and, and for now at least, uh, maybe there's some market in carbon fibers down the road or whatever. So that's why we said to government, you've got to share this cost. They responded with sharing it, right? But the bottom line is, if you're not buying the oil from us, you're buying it from Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iran, Nigeria, and a bunch of other places. So that choice is clear. I don't think America is, is um, going to bring back KXL the way it was, but I do think they're rethinking the mistake that they made. There's 800,000 barrels a day there. All we can give them today is two to 300,000 barrels extra, which they will use. Right? It's not going to Ukraine. They, they're going to use it because they need it to bring down the inflation pressures that they're facing. So I'm hoping this reality check is a moment where all of us, no matter what our views are on climate and all that other stuff, because none of us are denying anything, it's a transition, it's a journey, and we've got to make sure we leverage our existing resources to pay for that transition, which, as I said, we're all committed to doing. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be quick. So I think... Um, no tax on beer, right? No, sir. Yeah, that's my go-to line. <laughs> Um, like I think the energy contribution to GDP in Canada uh, has got to go up. Like you know, if, whether it was eight or ten percent, it's probably got to go to twelve or fourteen percent if we're really going to increase standards of living and grow our, the Canadian economy and become more competitive. There is a question of how much of it, of it will be renewable and how much of it will be non-renewable. And I think what I hear from Goldie is that we know we're at this transition point. I think these high oil and gas prices. Other commodity prices are going to drive Europe probably into recession. I think it's a moral issue now if you live in Europe and you're buying that, uh, that Russian oil and gas and you know what it's doing to people in Ukraine. It just got to the point, it's just so obvious now. And I think Goldie alluded to it, just even back to you know, Crimea. And I think some of those big economies in Europe are going to say, I can't buy it anymore. Or I have to buy a lot less and I eventually want to stop buying it. So the, I think the energy market, the volatility, we're just seeing the front end of it. It's going to be a really, you know, roller coaster ride over the next couple of years. Just remember, two years ago, the barrel was negative, <laughs> right? Which is one of the things we're asking the government to watch on assumptions. We don't know what oil prices will be in one year or two years. I think we have time for one more question. Be higher. One more question. One of the two, two gentlemen back there. If this is focused on the price of non-alcoholic beer, I will it take is. it. <laughs> Good morning, Steve Georgopoulos. Yeah, this is all people are going to remember, right? The, uh... <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. So I heard the word trillion one time and billion a number of times. So two figures that I'm going to take away, Goldie, is 750,000 people with disabilities in Canada and 50% of the indigenous population is less than 25. What, how can I measure that we're making progress on that? So I've taken a little notes on the cue cards. Who do I hold accountable for that? Uh, I'm going to add one other category, which I didn't mention, which is a mistake that I think the government has made, which is they changed the retirement age back from 67 to 65, and that took a lot of people that could still be working, and many are coming back. So we need everybody working is my message, right? And I think the, the way you're going to be able to measure that is fairly straightforward. Obviously, the data will tell you, and stats can actually monitors and measures this, uh, measures this data. So I suggest that, you know, that, we, uh, that we keep an eye on that. Um, labor market is so stretched right now that it almost doesn't even matter what your training is or your education is or anything. I will take you. I will make you a coder in six weeks or whatever it is that I need you to do. That's the kind of opportunities that are existing out there. So people want to work. They can work. I stress that because to me, the way you maintain support for immigration is to say, we have everyone in the country who wants to work, having a chance to work or is working. And you know what? We're still well short uh, of labor. Kevin? Yeah, I'll be real quick. And I apologize if I'm going to sound like a politician, but. There is a document that was tabled yesterday that talks about kind of quality of life, you know, as opposed to kind of the GDP impacts or the labor force impacts. What do you, you know, how much bigger will GDP growth be if you increase labor force participation, you know, for women, for disabled people, or even for First Nations people? But I, I think, like, I, I just, like, I'm a new grandfather. 
and uh, I'm going to have another, you know, and I, I just, I think it's such a better society if we focus on help, helping those sorts of people. Like, there are other indicators with respect to First Nations people, the children that Minister talked about, or just the opportunities, knowing that disabled people are working in the, in the workforce and we're making these adjustments. It's such a much nicer place to live. And to me, that, that goes beyond GDP. That's in that second document that no one's going to read. Right, which is probably people, I mean, the minister had it, it's the quality of life document. And I'm hoping that those numbers will be in that document, sir. Perfect. Goldie, Kevin, thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Sue Ling. Thank, thank you. You can just stay there. We're going to wrap up quickly. We're a little over time, but I want to say thank you for that fantastic, passionate discussion. And uh, we're really grateful for each of you making the time to be here today. I, I didn't bring you a statue to to collect dust in your office, but I am giving you a little gift card for the Shore Club Ross, <laughs> so you can uh, do your staycation and your local spending here as a gesture of appreciation for your time spent here today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't need to do that. You didn't need to do that. So well, it's, thank you. You know what? And I, Goldie's like, you don't need to do that. I want to just say, Goldie, I, I want to have this opportunity to say that you have been such a great friend to the Ottawa business community, even though you have a federal mandate, and, uh, and to the Ottawa Board of Trade. Every time we call you, you show up, every time. So thank you very much you, for thank being here today. Um, yeah. So just two quick things. We do have a couple of great events coming up. The Mayor's Breakfast on April the 14th. If you can join us, the Chief of Defense is going to be our keynote speaker. Also, our uh, annual Women, Wine, and Wisdom event is coming back in person on May the 12th. Hopefully, you can uh, join us for that as well. I hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you for being here and sharing your time with us. Thank you.